bon année and thanks for joining us for this edition of the Best of Reports, the show that brings you the best stories sent in by our correspondents over the last few days. Today we'll be in the city of Safed, which has been labelled the most racist place in Israel. Then we're off to Pennsylvania in the US, where people's health and the environment is being compromised for the sake of the local economy. Finally, it will be in Qatar, who was recently awarded the bid to host the 2022 Football World Cup. But it's Germany who stands to be the real winner. But first to Hungary, who's just taken over the rotating six-month presidency of the European Union. The government said it'll focus on finding an EU-wide strategy for integrating Roma, after France repatriated thousands back to Romania last year. But Budapest too has struggled to integrate its own Roma citizens, casting doubts on whether it'll succeed. Gulliver Krag reports. This is the main school building in Sud, a village near Budapest. But as pupils, Jolt and Attila Berki did not spend much time here. I like football, so I'd come up here and ask the Hungarians, can I join in? And they'd say, no, you can't. As gypsies, they wouldn't let us. On the pretext of ability-based segregation, the gypsies, or rather Roma, enrolled at Sud School were taught instead in this building, a few hundred yards away. With just three days teaching a week at best, it was not a place where you could hope to catch up. I'm nearly 25, and I can barely read or write. I mean, I can write my own name, but that's about it. I can't even do that. With backing from the NGO Chance for Children, mothers in the area formed a committee to sue for compensation and ensure that 29 local Roma who are currently at school age do get educated properly. It's thanks to us as parents that our children are not being taught in fire stations or storerooms, but in normal schools with normal teachers teaching them. This is not thanks to the government or the Prime Minister, but to ourselves. When it takes sustained grassroots action like this just to see existing anti-discrimination laws implemented, it's understandable that Hungary and Roma tend to be sceptical about their government's intentions. Yet Budapest insists it will use its EU presidency to equip Europe with a comprehensive Roma strategy. For the minister in charge, poor education is not just down to racism, but is part of a vicious cycle of poverty and ghettoization. Joined up is the buzzword. We would like the EU to provide a system that would make it easier to use its resources so that the three key areas, living circumstances, getting work and education, would be treated as a joined up complex of three. Roma integration is a burning political issue here. In Hungary's magnificent parliament, the hardline Jobbik party now has 47 seats. Its promise to eradicate so-called Roma crime was a big hit at last year's general election. On the other hand, though, Budapest is also home to the European Roma Rights Centre, lobbying fiercely for the presidency to deliver on its promise. When we discuss the European Roma strategy at the EU level, we also put forward recommendations that uh, link the EU funding to... uh, 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 Um, not allowing member states to uh, continue to to violate fundamental rights. Often misconceptions about the Roma are used to justify denying them those rights. Isabella Mikalake shows us a calendar depicting the real face of modern Roma life. Most Roma, like her, are settled. But unlike her, too many are settled in insalubrious, crime-ridden slums, still waiting for Europe to come up with a plan that member states would really stick to. To Israel now and the city of Safed, famous for being one of the four main holy cities of Judaism and the birthplace of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. But these days it's getting a reputation for all the wrong reasons. While its famous son is trying to negotiate peace between the Palestinian and Israeli communities, relations between Safed's Jewish and Arab residents are rapidly declining. Galia Fenech was there. After a set of rabbis issued a controversial decree in this little town nestled in the hills of northern Galilee, Safed has become the most recent symbol of tense relations between Jewish and Arab communities in Israel. The religious ruling bans local Jews from renting or selling property to non-Jews. This prompted a well-known Israeli editorialist to call Safed the most racist city in the country. Yo Yehuda's father sits on the religious council which drafted the document. He feels the move was justified. According to him, it protects the city's values and identity. 
During Shabbos, our day of rest, the Arabs drive through the streets playing loud Arab music. They don't want to coexist, and they don't respect the Jewish identity and spirit of Safed. And lately, they've started dating Jewish girls as well. The Arab residents in town are all students at the local college. Mahmoud Abu Saleh is at the head of their union. He was offended by the ruling and the violent comments it sparked. Death to the Arabs. That means I should die. Why should I have to be killed? There are over a thousand Arab students at Safed College. But Mahmoud says only 200 of them live in this city with 40,000 Israeli Jews. Despite the school's support, it has become nearly impossible for Arab students to find housing in Safed, according to Mahmoud. He rejects allegations that he and his Arab peers are trying to take the city back from its Jewish residents. We want to tell the racist people in this town that we came here just to study, to get our diploma. We don't want any problems. There's no reason to give us trouble. Mahmoud says not everyone in Safed is supportive of the ban. He introduces us to Eliyahu Zvieli, an 89-year-old survivor of the camps. Despite the threats from rabbis who accuse him of treason, Eliyahu continues to rent rooms in his apartment to Arab students. During the Second World War, I fled Germany and was interned in a Russian camp. There were people from all over the place there, from Germany, Italy, Hungary or Romania. Even back then, I didn't care where people came from. I just know that there are good and bad people. Following in Safed's footsteps, dozens of other rabbis across Israel have signed a petition urging Jews to refrain from renting or selling to non-Jews. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu denounced such religious rulings as being undemocratic. Israeli authorities now have to decide whether they're illegal as well or simply inappropriate. Now, if you've never heard of fracking, don't be surprised. It's the name of a new method of extracting natural gas, and it's currently all the rage in Pennsylvania, USA. It involves forcing water and chemicals into the earth to cause small tremors that release pockets of gas that were previously inaccessible. But this new technology comes with a price. Because it's so new, extractors haven't yet found a way to stop it polluting the local environment and water reservoirs. Guillaume Meyer and Natalie Handel found out more. This rural homestead is where Craig Sotner had always wanted to enjoy a peaceful retirement. Instead, for the past two years, he's been fighting a war with a company that extracts natural gas locally using a method known as fracking. To show us the problem, Craig takes us to his basement. Like many rural Americans, the Sotners have their own well. But this is what their water looks like since drilling got underway around their property. Oh, it's got a weird smell, too. For months, this family drank contaminated water unknowingly. By the time the pollution became visible, everyone had gotten sick. My daughter had eczema up and down you know, in her elbows. My son had it up and down his legs. Uh, my daughter had hives up and down her body. My wife had hives all over. And, you know, it all came from the water, using this water here. Craig believes this gas rig is the culprit. He and other victims say the drilling caused gas and chemicals to seep into the groundwater. But in this corner of America, most people are too worried about their jobs to care about the environment. Many locals rejoiced at the discovery here of what could be the biggest gas reserves in the country. Customers at this restaurant remember that until recently, there simply wasn't much to do around Dimmock. Many places are hiring until now because of the gas economy. Now everybody's getting jobs. It's starting to pick up real good. These activists disagree. They say the gas boom is only temporary while drilling could destroy the region's natural economic treasure, its environment. So this is a recreation, hunting, fishing, uh, um, and tourist area. And none of those activities are, are going to take place if there's drilling here and there's fumes and the kind of act, uh, industrialized industrial activity that takes place where drilling is done. Sacrificing the environment for money, it's a choice Bill Ely didn't realize he was making. He agreed to lease his land against a monthly check, a decision he now regrets. 
You know, it isn't worth it. It isn't worth it because you know what? I can live without that royalty check. I can't live without my water. I have to drink water every day or I'll die. Bill knew something was wrong when he discovered he could set his water on fire. How high is burning? Burn went this high. Put your, let's see like what it is. Okay. Now he and his neighbors are suing the gas company and asking that their water be restored to its original pristine condition. The Asian Cup football tournament is getting underway this weekend in Qatar, and it's largely being seen as a test for the country that was recently designated host of the World Cup in 2022. FIFA's decision caused some controversy, but one country at least is celebrating Qatar's success. The tiny Gulf state, which has a population of less than 2 million people, has appointed a number of German firms to construct their climate-controlled stadia and other new infrastructure. Anne Maillet and Abby Darcy-Hughes sent this report. These are the plans for the World Cup in 2022, and Qatar now holds the keys. Behind it all is a team of architects and engineers from Albert Speer and Partner in Frankfurt. The firm drew up plans for the stadiums and designs for urban development. They put together Qatar's World Cup bid with great care. It weighs more than four kilograms. The team have earned themselves a reputation. A couple of years back, South Africa asked for help in its bid for the 2010 World Cup. Deutsche Germany is recognized internationally for its expertise in planning, and German engineering is much sought after. The 2006 World Cup in Germany gave us a chance to prove that German design can be detailed and reliable. The stadiums will be kept cool using a system running on solar power, keeping the temperature at a steady 20 degrees. Afterwards, the stadiums can be taken apart and offered to football federations in developing countries. The first World Cup in the Middle East will be all about innovation. Now Qatar has won the bid, they're expected to sign the first contracts with Albert Speer partner next week. The architects ought to be flat out for the next decade. It's a whole new market that's opening up to us. This will be the first time that we work on a sporting event of this scale and the first time that we've planned and designed from the start. And Qatar isn't just interested in what German architects and engineers have to offer. The German rail company Deutsche Bahn has been asked to construct a new metro line and the construction giant Hochtief will build the stadiums and team base camps. Beyond that, dozens more small and medium-sized German companies are expected to win lucrative contracts. Qatar may be buying German know-how in bulk, but they're also investing. They now hold stakes in Volkswagen, Porsche and Hochtief. In 2009, Qatar invested invested 4.5 billion euros in the Made in Germany label. For the Middle East specialists, it's just the beginning. These are prestigious companies with huge market value and which promise long-term returns. What I think Qatar wants to do is to really invest in companies when they're running minimal risk of making losses in the next five to ten years. And as Qatar invests in its post-petrol future, Germany could continue to profit long after the World Cup is over. Sadly, that's it for us this time, but you can see more of the week's stories on our website, www.france24.com. Join us again next week for more of the best of reports. Same time, same place. Bye for now.